Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to the Justice Subcommittee on Policing. This is our ninth meeting of uh, 2018. We have no apologies. Uh, but before we begin, I'd like to place on record my thanks to Ben McPherson for his work as a member of the subcommittee and wish him all the very best in his ministerial role. Um, and the first item is uh, uh, to, uh, to welcome Fulton uh, to the committee and back onto the Justice Committee, the Parent Committee, um, and ask if there's any declarations of interest that you require to make. Fulton. Yeah, thanks, Convener. No uh, relevant declarations of interest for the subcommittee. OK, thank you very much indeed. Um, the next decision is on taking business in private. Um, and that's item four, when we'll consider our work programme and some other matters. Are members agreed to take that in private? Agreed. Okay, thank you very much indeed. So, next item on our agenda is Police Scotland's proposed use of digital device triage systems. Um, and uh, we'll take evidence from Mr David Freeland, Senior Policy Officer at the Information uh, Commissioner's Office, uh, Detective Chief Superintendent uh, Jerry McLean, Head of Organised Crime and Counterterrorism, and Peter Benson's Cyber Crime Forensic Team Leader, uh, Police Scotland, and Diego Quirzos, uh, Policy Officer, Scottish Human Rights Commission. Um, you're all very welcome, and can I thank you for uh, those of you who have given written contributions. That's always very helpful. Um, I wonder, can I kick off some questioning, please, perhaps to yourself, um, Chief Superintendent McLean. W thank you for the various documents that, that, that's been sent to. These trials commenced in 2016. Why is it that here we are some two years later and the document in relation to the data protection impact assessment is still marked as draft? Yes, thanks, Convener. Uh, firstly, can I thank you for inviting us along to give evidence to the Justice Committee today. Um, we welcome the opportunity and more particularly to, to answer the question you've put to us. Um, I think in terms of the finance framework in 2016 and 17 um, didn't support the trials at that time. So those internal trials trying to look at the benefits realisation to frontline officers, service improvement and the experience of the public were something that we were keen to examine. <clears throat> but however, the, the constraints within the force at that time didn't allow us to progress them. Um, we took some advice at that time. Um, we obviously didn't have GDPR with us at, at that time. So the impact assessments that were considered were, were different from, from where we are now. But more particularly, your question about the DPIA uh, and the Equality Human Rights Impact Assessment. We've drafted them uh, after some consultation with some of the reference groups, which perhaps we'll speak about earlier on. And we see them very much as needing to be completed, but at the moment, living documents until everyone can have a chance to examine them, make a contribution to that. And even as recently as last week, some of the groups who have engaged the external reference group were making contributions, particularly around the, about the EQHRI RA, RIA document, my apologies. Um, so we are hoping to get them to quite an advanced position where we can finally get sign off on those documents and get some agreement across the various groups who have contributed towards them. Is there any recognition on the part of Police Scotland that best practice would be to make an assessment in advance of doing something rather than at the conclusion? I mean, I welcome where we are and I welcome the engagement with the stakeholder and the reference groups. I think that's very positive, but it would be good to hear that from Police, Police Scotland. Yes, I accept that, Convener, that we, we need to make some ass assessment of that and some of it was talking about the benefits realisation over perhaps the impact to the wider public in terms of introducing new technologies. So I totally accept that, that position that you've described. I suppose, conversely, there's our piece that until you actually think about the introduction of the technology, the training implications, how it's going to be delivered, the audit and compliance around about that and the wider impact on the public, it's perhaps only then that you can truly articulate that within the various impact assessments. But I do take your point. Except that it's a developing document, and, and is there much changed in from what you would have originally assessed in? If you're saying it's an evolving situation, no, fa fairly minor. Um, so the external reference group, some of the contributions there were around about the various articles under the Convention of Human Rights, particularly around about the right to a fair trial, so Article Six and Eight, the right to privacy. So. I suppose, generally putting, they would look to see a bit more detail, so fleshing out some of the considerations that uh, are within that document. So um, it's perhaps seen as a bit too much police jargon um, and needs to detail some of the wider implications for the general public. So that's why we're quickly revising that document and hopefully get to position um, in the next few weeks where we can get sign off on that. OK, thank you. Mr Quiros. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I should say, just leave your button at open. No. Thank you very much for inviting the commission. And I think um, this is a really good question that has been uh, asked uh, to the police um, before um, the convener asked this question the 10th of May. Uh, human rights impact, human rights impact assessment and equality impact assessment are essential 
prerequisite to ensure that policy programs and projects are compliant with human rights. And they should be done in advance, um, uh, even if, if, if you are running a, a, a trial. So the, the, the Commission has um, significant concerns about the, the, the trial of 600 phones and, and the legality and the procedure, how, how it has been run so far. We have to acknowledge as well that we don't have a full information about the, the trial. I, I was just learning about that uh, earlier. And while the police has recently adopted an open and, and, and multi-stakeholder approach, it has not been the case from, from the outset. It, it, I think this highlights a, a, a wider issue is the importance of a human rights-based approach in policing, something that we, ha we have recommended for, for a while. But if you allow me to, to focus on, on the current human rights impact assessment, I'm afraid that the current assessment highlights a, a number of concerns. First of all, the, the documents uh, conflates certain legislative protections with human rights protections. And I will focus on, on only one because of time. So the analysis of Article 8 really relies heavily on, on data protection requirements. If you, it reads, this article will be heavily protected due to the document's compliance with GDPR. The data protection framework, which is a data processing, is separate from the human rights framework. Compliance with this framework, while necessary, is not sufficient by itself to meet human rights requirements. So it is crucial, and this is a crucial point, I would say, and one that requires further analysis by, by the police. I don't think it's only a bit of, of tweaking or, or, or a bit of analysis. It requires further, much more analysis, because the distinction between privacy and data protection are fundamental to understand how they interact and how they complement each other. Privacy concerns arise when personal identifiable, identifiable information is collected, stored, and used, which is not the case here, but is the case on hubs. And, and that is a legal question that focuses on justify or unjustified interference. Data protection is about securing data against Unauthorized, unauthorized access, it is a technical question about the conditions to facilitate full and lawful uh, protection of the data. So we are worried that these two distinctions are treated as, as the same and synonyms in the human rights impact assessment. Data protection is an expression of the right of privacy, but not the same under the European Convention on Human Rights. And there are further issues that I could um, get back to them if the committee wants. It, it, it may be that. We'll, thank you very much for that. That we'll pick up on these, and, and of course, there's always the opportunity to perhaps write us to, to, to clarify a point. Said. Do you briefly want to respond to that, Chief Superintendent yes, McLean? Convener, so um, I accept all the points that Diego made from the Human Rights Commission, and my apologies to him and the Convener and the Committee if I was too general in my my sort of view of of where I said we were with the revision work around about the impact assessments. But the points that uh, Diego has made, I, I readily accept, and it was the same points that Privacy International made at the last reference group meeting that we held. So that they are the substantive points that we are working on, and I accept that. Okay, thank you. I, I just able, before I pass to other members for questions, to say where we are at this particular moment with progress. Are we on schedule for the start date that you anticipated? And okay, will so all these mechanisms and be in place prior to that? An assurance on that, please? So I think I previously briefed the, the committee before that we had a, um, an indicative uh, rollout period of around about October of this year, 2018. Um, but at the same time, we recognise the importance of the consultation engagement. Um, so in general terms, where we are, there's a lot of progress being made in terms of the training delivery, refining what that would look like across the whole force area to ensure that there's adequate coverage in terms of local officers providing local delivery. Um, we've now had two meetings, each of the stakeholders groups. So those are the the groups um, such as the Police Federation, HMICS and, and other groups who are more integral, you may say, to the criminal justice system. So we've had two meetings of that group, uh, the most recent being yesterday. And we've had two meetings of the external reference groups, so Open Rights Group, Privacy International, uh, there's invites for Human Rights Commission, Information Commissioner and others. Um, and the most recent of that meeting was, was last week. Um, in essence, the points that we are focused on is the legal basis for the examination of devices. Um, and the processes around about the use of cyber kiosks and less so about the equipment itself, if, if would be my view. Um, the substantive point <coughs> being there that the equipment 
does not extract or store data. So thereby it's the wider considerations, and I suppose Diego has touched on, on some of them. Um, we are hurriedly working on three document sets. One is a public information leaflet. One is a principles of use document, um, which would articulate the mechanisms by which data would be managed and, the, and those cyber kiosks would be used. And one is a, an internal document for the, the users, which is a toolkit. But to more particularly answer your question, we're hoping that if we can get all those document sets, which we're working on currently, ready by about the end of October when those groups meet again, we can look at a potential rollout commencing early November. OK, thank you very much indeed. I, I said that was my final one, but uh, actually, just following on from one of your points, if I, if I may please, um, before passing on, because we have a number of questions, um, I'm looking at the, the um, minute of the meeting of 26 July of the, the reference group, and an issue that appears in there that um, has the issue of a situation whereby a, witnesses, a witness gives over their phone and then subsequently changes their mind. There's reference in there to discussions with Crown Office Procurator of Fiscal Service about that. Is that issue being res reserved, because, resolved? Because a lot of people would understand a, a different arrangement applying to witnesses than there would be to a, a suspect or indeed an accused. Yeah. So that, that's a, a point that we discussed at the stakeholders group, and it's very difficult to get a, a, a position that covers every eventuality, as the, I'm sure the, the committee would recognise. But what we have been explicit on is what the legal basis would be for the police to seize a phone, whether that be from a witness, a victim, or indeed an accused person. And the legal basis is, is threefold. It would be under warrant, um, on some occasions under a statutory framework, such as the Misuse of Drugs Act legislation. But more particularly and more frequently, it would be a common law power. So even in the eventuality that a witness offered a, a device saying that there's something that has a a material bearing on the matter under investigation, then the legal basis for which the police would hold that would be a common law power. Um, it's very difficult to cover every eventuality about what can be examined within that device, um, what can be offered and can the witness get that device back, uh, depending on the case uh, under investigation. So clearly the police have some discretion at their disposal, but I think as soon as that's been taken as a production and entered into the evidential chain, then actually maybe it will be a matter for the prosecution and ultimately the court to deem the fairness in which the device was taken and, and the material importance of the content on that device. But in that minute, it specifically says Crown Office Procurator Fiscal's position is that this is an operational matter for the police. So this is around about the discretion element of it and also some of the, the statutory obligations that we have under the disclosure leg legislation to, so to apply a test of relevance. Does, is the phone relevant to the matter under investigation? Should it be taken? Should it be examined? Um, so, as, as I say, it's difficult to cover every eventuality on that. I understand that. I wonder, would it be possible, Chief Superintendent McLean, to maybe get a number of examples of yeah. wh wh where the circumstances, brief circumstances of where phones have been seized in respect of, for instance, an accused person or a, a suspect or, or, or indeed a witness, just to give the, the committee some understanding of parameters and what applied. I appreciate that would have taken place under the trial, but... You would like me to provide that at a later stage? Yes, please. Yes. Yes. In, in writing. Thank Happy you. to do so. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, Margaret. Yeah. Good afternoon, gentlemen. I, I wonder if you could maybe give some further information on the rationale for the divisional breakdown of the, the, the cyber chaos ter terminals and also the factors taken into account in deciding where they'd be located and the number that would be located, for example, Q Division, which is Lanarkshire, has four. So why four and other, re uh, other uh, divisions only two? Yes, I'm happy to take that question, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, so there's been a lot of close working between the cybercrime hubs and cybercrime professionals and the, the divisional management teams within each of the 13 local police areas across Scotland. So to answer your question in particular, what we did was we provided demand analysis. So in terms of all the devices that have been submitted in the last couple of years, what did that look like pro rata per local policing area? Um, we then very much worked with the local policing areas for them to decide, one, in terms of their deployment model, how that could be resourced with the cadre of trained officers available and at their disposal, uh, aligned to the sort of demand that they think they might see across their divisions. Um, so it was very much a matter for them as to how many devices they could take or could support within each of their areas, um, aligned with the, some of the, the, the statistical data that we provide per division. Um, so you'll see that in some of the larger geographic areas, particularly in the north of Scotland, um, A division is, is, will be taking five, 
um, and the end division will be taking four. So some of that was around about the geographic challenges in those areas. But when you come down to the central belt, some of the local policing areas are all different sizes, have different levels of crime and thereby a different level of digital forensic needs. Um, so it was working very closely with the divisional management teams and some of the numbers um, and the locations, they were all set locally by the divisional management teams within the local policing areas. So were they the ultimate arbiter of, of, who, uh, of how many there were, there were um, in each division or was there any disagreement or discussion um, or, on the number? Um, as, as I understand it, it was all fairly amicable. There was no um, real issues around about that. I think the point to make is, are these figures um, appropriate and, and will they change? The, the whole piece is that this will be part of a continual review process. So we'll continue, as once we roll out the kiosk, to review what that demand is, the amount of submissions, some of the benefits within those areas, some of the demands within local policing. So can the cadre of trained officers continue to be resourced if there's a turnover of staff? So it'll be under continual review, and it may well be that those figures are adjusted um, as, we, as we go along that journey. OK, happy. Thank you. Uh, Rona. Thank you, convener. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Just yes, just on that, that the last point there about the review process. Um, can you give us a time scale of that? Is this going to be? Is there, is there an end date to it? And then you're going to say, well, we'll consider expansion and that kind of thing, and, and, and rolling out more. Is that the the plan, or are you? Can you just give us an idea of time scales, basically? Sure. Um, so I think I think what's come out loud and clear about this is is audit and compliance is a really important part around about the data security, data privacy. So what we propose to do once we go into a go live, and it'll be an incremental rollout, um, so simultaneously in the east, north and west of the country, but incrementally to a full rollout over a course of perhaps three months, certainly by the early part of 2019, would be our, our aspiration. And um, what we'd look to do is, upon going live in a particular area, is start to generate some information, some performance data around about that. So how many submissions, any breaches, non-compliance issues, report that in through the Scottish Police Authority, but also we're looking at the publication scheme to see or not we can make that data publicly available on the Police Scotland uh, website, if you will. So very much public facing that point of view. Our aim you, is, sorry, sorry, on you go, no, on you go. Our, our aim is to be reviewing the, the deployment model probably after about six months. So from the point of going live in one part of the country, it will probably take us about three months to complete the whole country. Or thereabouts. Okay, thank so you. probably uh, yeah. about six months we'll, we'll do a full review of that whole process. But what we will do is capture learning as we move from one area to the next so that hopefully the product that's delivered towards the end of that role will be the best product we can we can have. And if you found in a particular area that basically was being underused or not used, would it then be taken away or is that would that be the idea? Just well, I mean, not be as extreme as that. I think there'd be an opportunity to maybe do a bit of deconfliction. So if there's some... Uh, local policing areas that have more devices that are underused and some that have greater demand, then I think there's a conversation to be had around about that. Mm -hmm. You know, I suppose in the, the circumstances, we, are, we approach this in a very positive fashion, but for recognising the public interest around about that and some of our responsibilities. But if we start to realise some of the benefits that we think we will, then there probably is a consideration about, you know, would we look at making greater use of that type of technology? Mm -hmm. Is the demand there or actually we quelled a lot of the demand and stripped a lot of the volume out at the front end? Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Thank you. Mr Kiros, you wanted to come in? If I may, just to roll back a bit before uh, talking about deployment to, to your very, very uh, relevant question about legality, uh, which is a very important under human rights and, and, and the rule of law. And, and it covers two aspects. One is the existence of, of a legal framework, and, um, and some, some of that is, it has been expressed by by Police Scotland, uh, but the other point is once there is a legal, legal framework, is the, the question is on the quality of, of that legal framework. So accessing sensitive and personal data certainly engages Article 8, and there is a cluster of, of cases in Strasbourg coming from the European Court of Human Rights that confirm that, everything from Copland to Kennedy to SN Marper. Uh, so that's, that's, that's quite clear. The cyber cost can access private data, uh, and we know that uh, everything from text to photos, web browsing, and even more sensitive data as biometric data. So um, many of our phones, my phone has my fingerprints and voice, etc. And in, in a criminal law context, it, it even can have um, 
uh, some information uh, about journalistic material or legally privileged information. So incredibly sensitive data. So the, the framework and, and, and the legality of it is an important one. So we could say that it is possible to find more private information in a mobile phone than in a bedroom or in a house. And if, if we keep this metaphor for, for a second, the police needs a warrant to search your house. If this is the case, certainly a more or equally intru intrusive digital measure would require similar safeguard. But uh, this is the, the first time that I, I, I hear the police mentioning the, the idea of, of using uh, warrants. And um, I think the, the commission would not be uh, satisfied if, if there is no similar uh, legal safeguard as, as when we search a, a house in, in Scotland. Uh, Chief Superintendent McLean, I, I took that to be one of the options that, that could be used. Um, can you clarify the issue of a warrant um, before Daniel comes in? And then perhaps Mr Freeland, you'd like to comment on what you've heard, please. Yeah, so, so just to clarify, the, the legal basis said was, was threefold. One was uh, a warrant, one was a, a statutory um, power that the police would have at that particular time, um, and one would be a common law power. But more particularly in relation to the warrant, what I meant by that was that the warrant empowered the police to search at that particular uh, time and that particular location to recover a number of items that were pertinent to the investigation. So the warrant would, would empower the search which may include the taking of mobile devices, but it's been a long-held principle within Scottish law, and as the view of Crown Office, articulated through our stakeholder reference group, that having taken it under either warrant, statutory powers, or a common law uh, power, that we are then entitled to examine electronic digital devices. Mr Freeland, and then Daniel, please. Um, I think I'd just like to say, for, for the committee's awareness, that... Uh, the whole issue of um, use of, of this type of evidence and uh, how it's uh, obtained, obtaining digital evidence um, is a priority issue for our office at the moment. And we're looking at this um, across the UK in relation to all law enforcement agencies, um, very much supported by the um, Information Privacy International have already provided us on police forces use. Um, the, the legality of obtaining the data in and of itself is, a, is an important area and we want to do more work to understand, um, particularly in relation to the statutory powers. Actually, are those statutory powers fit for purpose? Um, do they actually um, allow uh, the, an intrusion into the digital space um, where you know, they may, these powers were formulated maybe decades ago when we weren't kind of considering this so we want to understand better actually what what is the legal position is it lawful in the first place because if it's not lawful in the first place then we need there needs to be some uh, legislative solution to, to bring uh, the statutory powers up to date and and who would determine that mr freeland uh, i think that that's probably well ult ultimately the, the legal <coughs> basis um, is, is between the parliament and the courts obviously we need to make sure that there is a, a substantive uh, legal basis uh, but it's an issue that obviously uh, Diego and, and myself and others will want to explore with Police Scotland uh, further. OK, thank you. Daniel? Thank you, Kavina. If you don't mind me saying, that's quite a showstopper statement that you've just made there. And just to clarify, you, you're saying that you're not clear whether or not there is, there is sufficient legal basis for the, the police to access the data in this way using these devices. Is that, is that, is that, is that a correct I think for, for our purposes, we need to know that the processing of personal data is lawful. Uh, the police have said what their, their various lawful bases are, warrant, statutory or common law powers, and we just want to understand um, the extent of those powers. We are not experts in criminal law itself, so we need to do some work to, to understand, actually, is this lawful and fair? I, I mean, I'd be quite interested from a, uh, by a response from the police on that, and, and in terms of whether you're confident that, that you can access this da data lawfully uh, and whether or not you think that there's sufficient uh, sufficient um, access or, or sufficient grounds in, on the from basis of uh, existing legislation. Um, so to be quite explicit, I am confident, uh, and I think that's borne out by the many prosecutions that go through Scottish courts and examined every day and every year, um, and, and any challenges around about that and it's a position that the court has upheld, that the police have had the power to examine those devices. You know, I previously talked to this committee before about the 15,000 or so devices that go through our cybercrime, cybercrime hubs every year um, and then make their way into the criminal justice system. Um, and they're able to push back any of those, those challenges. 
Um, but that's a position that's held by Crown as well, and we've asked them as part of the stakeholders group, are they comfortable with that position? And, and they, would, they would echo that, they would support that. Can, can, I, can I just also follow up? And one of the, the reasons I was wanting to come in is, is the point that, that uh, Mr Kira has uh, raised there, is that the, the, the sheer scope of information that's now held on, on mobile phones is very significant. So I think there is one point, in, in, to my mind, about having access to that and, and the sort of the, 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 the hurdles and, and protections you put around that. But the other point, and it's associated, but it's not identical in my mind, is that, 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 that the permission may be granted for one purpose and one form of, of data, but then what are the protections, provisions to prevent uh, accessing other kinds of, of data. Is that is that a valid concern or you know are there considerations and I'd be very interested in hearing from Mr Freeland around that as well. Uh, that's that's absolutely right. Um, so for, well this is the first time that we hear about warrants and I think they rely on common law uh, for those um, searches and digital searches and but my the, the, the symbol that I use is more in relation to a house that that I stop and search that a digital stop and search because of the sensitive information in 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 and very personal information about individual identity and social relations so it's, it's the 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 symbol would be more accurate if, if it's about a house so if we need a, a warrant to, to search a house and and we would need something similar in terms of legal safeguards. So that's the, that's the, the first point. Uh, the, the second point is that a warrant has to be a specific. A, a warrant by itself could be unlawful, as, as, as you, you already know. So it has to be specific enough to cover the, the reference that, that you are mentioned. So it cannot be about all the data in the mobile phone. It could be. It has to be relevant to, to the case. Otherwise, it would be unlawful. So it, it, it requires a, a, a bit more of nuance that that just a, a warrant. And, and and having said that, of course, there are statutory powers that allow the police to to do that. And those cases, the 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 legality is quite clear. There are other cases which are not clear for us. I think from from our perspective as well, in terms of, of purpose, data protection law is always quite clear um, that information should be obtained for a specified, explicit and legitimate purpose. And that purpose should be established at the outset to then further use it for some completely different purpose or unrelated purpose um, would not uh, comply with data protection law. Um, and I think just to, to echo the point there as well, of the, one of the other principles of data protection law is that um, the information that you obtain must be adequate, relevant, and not or, sorry, limited to the, the specific purpose as well. So uh, in this kind of context, very much evidence-led policing and not um, obtaining everything um, just in case there might be something there, but actually following, following the evidence. Just briefly, does modern technology make, not make that very problematic in that once you've got you know, you've unlocked the phone, you've unlocked the whole thing, and actually sort of saying, well, I'm only going to look at this one bit is actually quite difficult, especially if it's, you know, police looking through potentially sort of social media uh, or something like that, which is very expensive. Is that problematic? It, it potentially is. There is then an, an intrusion. If you're going through all text messages, then there's potentially an intrusion into other people's private conversations which are not relevant to the case, uh, rather than focusing on, well, the, the conversations between the particular persons who are already of interest. And if there is, a, you know, if, if uh, that kind of interrogation leads to actually some other people are of interest, then the evidence leads you to something that is that is further relevant to to the case. But extracting everything wholesale um, already puts you at a, a risk of non-compliance. So, so, are you satisfied on the basis of what you've seen that the police have have got sufficient kind of granularity of of, of thinking to deal with that? Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, I want to understand the, the process um, at the cyber hub end of things in greater detail. Okay. I, I don't know if you briefly want to respond to that, Chief Superintendent McLean. I'm conscious there are occasions where you might crave a warrant to search for item A and, and cover item B, and that's, there are issues around that legally, of course. Um, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so, again, it's very convenient, it's very difficult to cover every eventuality, but I think. The overriding principle is that um, the fairness of the search and the evidence used against an accused or otherwise will be a matter for the court to, to, to determine um, in terms of how the police came by that, that information. But I, 
I'm, I'm not averse to any of the points made by, by either um, David or Diego. And one of the key parts that we have built into the delivery of the, the cyber kiosks or triage devices is, is the issue around about proportionality and necessity. So very much the, the checks and balances from the point of the investigating officer, doing an electronic submission, checking that through a supervisor, through the trained officer and potentially through to a cyber hub, will all be based on what is the matter that's under investigation, what search parameters are you applying to, to that device and what is it you, you think you may find within that, so that it is not just a phishing exercise, I think is the point that Diego was making, that if, if, you, if you're looking too wide, then, then you're going beyond some of your responsibilities. If it's one matter that's under investigation, then you, that your, your search of that device should be appropriate to that. So proportionality and, and necessity, it may well be that you have a raft of evidence from other sources, independent witnesses, and it may well be that the examination of that device is, is not relevant in, in particular circumstances. So proportionality and necessity are two key, um, propon uh, two key elements sorry, of the, the, key, the kiosk delivery. Yeah, I have a couple of members to come in, perhaps before they do. Uh, um, again, referring to your data protection impact uh, assessment, question 47 relates to Article 8, and it clearly hasn't provided reassurance to Mr uh, Kiros. But it does say, in, 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 in response to how you would deal with Article 8, respect for uh, private and family life and the various elements thereof, it says, yes, as, as per any inquiry or investigation involving digital media, there's an element of collateral intrusion. This will be managed using current and established policy procedures and practices. Yeah. Are you able to <coughs> so, expand on what? So I think it's just it's the point that David was making. You know, if if we take a device and we examine it, then we image the whole device, we we extract, download, examine all of the data on that device. We then try and secure that data. Uh, we don't make it available to other officers. We look at the sensitive material and it's legally privileged, journalistic. I mean, in terms of look at it, consider it. So it would be a better use of language. Um, so we try to mitigate the, the clatter intrusion, but we accept from the very outset that if you're going to image the device or, or, or other parts of investigations, you always run the risk of some collateral intrusion. OK, thank you. Margaret? Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you could comment on pr pr uh, Privacy International's reports which suggested that police forces are using the technology in the UK without um, the clear safeguards uh, for the public in particular, they, they suggest that Police Scotland are acting unlawfully in this area and that citizens' rights and interests are not fully protected. Now, you said quite clearly a warrant in certain circumstances should be obtained. Are you confident it always has been obtained? And where is the independent scrutiny to safeguard against abuse and misuse of what you've already said could be very sensitive and personal information? Um, okay, so if, if I can answer that one convenient. Um, I think, the, having read the Privacy International report, um, it, it gives a, an overview of how these types of technologies are being used across the UK. So some of them are different types of technologies, some of them are being applied differently, and often there's very different um, sets of policy and procedures around about the use of that. More particularly, the, the assertion that Police Scotland are acting unlawfully um, I, I would defend that position and say that's not correct. One, in terms of cyber kiosks or devices, we have not rolled them out. So um, we are developing policy and procedure around about that, and I've already touched on it. You're not rolling them out, but you have trialled them, and that had an impact on the public. OK. Um, and, and then more particularly, um, the second piece about a warrant. So just if I can perhaps convene a come back and clarify, I was not suggesting at any time that we would ask for a warrant to examine a mobile device. What I'm seeing is that mobile devices will often be seized as part of a wider search that uh, has been facilitated under the powers of a warrant. And that independent scrutiny about fairness uh, will, will be applied within the court environment as to whether or not the police did have the powers at that particular time to take those devices and conduct the investigation or examination that they undertook thereafter. Yeah, I suppose I'm a wee bit concerned that um, finally you're saying the court will decide that I would hope the guidelines were sufficiently robust that it would be quite clear in your own mind there would be no question when you got to court that it had been seized law lawfully. So I think there's a bit of confusion there. Can I ask you, therefore, if the reference group find there's not sufficient legal basis for the police to access data, will the rollout continue? 
So I was that to myself. So could you just yeah. repeat the question? Of if the reference group find there is not sufficient legal basis for the police to access data, will the rollout continue? Well, the rollout has not commenced, so it's, it's not so much that it would continue, but um, I, I'm maybe being pedantic there. But I think if they were to raise substantive points, then those are points that need to be, to be addressed. And that's the whole point of the consultation. I, I take it you're assuming that it is going to go ahead. We've got a number of chaos. We seem to be into a lot of detail. I think it's a reasonable assumption that um, it is going to be rolled out. Well, but if the review, ga view, if the review yeah. reference group comes back and says there isn't sufficient legal basis, will the rollout still continue? I think at that point, if we had no legal basis, we, we would have to suspend the rollout. I think we would have to accept that. If there was no legal basis to use that technology in Scotland, then, then it would be inappropriate for us to continue the rollout. So it's absolutely essential that you work very closely with Mr Goritz and Mr Freeland to ensure that you're absolutely clear and there's no confusion about exactly your powers and that they're being used appropriately. Yeah, very much so, and we welcome the opportunity. Thank you. Stuart, then, Fulton. Um, I just wanted to finally nail down the issue of warrants and access to data. And to do so, I give an example. There's a court case on. Um, the accused is, as would normally the case, been told by the court must go nowhere near any witness. A witness sees the accused outside their house. They live on their own, using the mobile phone to photograph the house and what appears to be going on in the house. They report to the police. I take it, therefore, point one, the police can reasonably get a warrant to look at that mobile phone to get the corroborating evidence that such activity was taking place. But in doing so, they will look through the folder of all the photographs. If they were to find, for example, illegal images of young children, would the police be able to act on that second point as well as the first scenario that I've dealt with? OK. Um, <clears throat> so I think if the police thought they had to seek a warrant, the warrant would be to empower them probably to be in a private place to recover that device. The warrant would not be... Uh, that's the accepted principle in Scotland. The warrant would not be required to examine the phone and thereby the content. The second point I think you make is around about self-incrimination. So if, if the police are being proportionate and applying the rules of necessity and proportionality and looking for one piece of information within a, a digital examination that has a bearing on the matter and the investigation, but in doing so find something completely different, then they would have some responsibility as, as law enforcement to bring that to the attention of prosecutors for the potential for either other powers to be afforded to them or to consider um, a, a separate investigation and possibly prosecution for those matters. That's fine. Come here. Thank you. Yes, Mr Curtis. Yeah, I, I think the, the issue with the warrant is, is something that I mentioned before, um, perhaps I wasn't very clear, is that it has to be a very specific warrant in, in, in this particular case because um, if, if you have a warrant to search a house and, and you go into the house and, and there is a, a, a folder or documentation that it says confidential, that warrant not necessarily will allow you to, to, to open that, that documentation. So it's, it's, it's similar with a mobile phone. You can seize and you can confiscate the mo mobile phone, but a different issue is, is to examine the, the content of the data. And this, this highlights another human rights implication, which is, is on Article 6 of, of, the, of the Convention, and in terms of fair rules of evidence. Um, it means that proper examination of the method in, in which the um, evidence was obtained and admitted in the criminal proceedings are correctly are, are a matter for the court, and it's a matter for the, 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 the law, whether the evidence is of dubious quality and the rights of the defense have been respected or is improperly obtained, it's for the national court, but certainly engages Article 6. And, 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 and this is a completely different level from Article 8. So Article 8, Article 6, and, and, and even Article 10 are um, significantly engaged in, in, in this um, um, in new policy, and they need to be rigorously be scrutinised and examined before uh, it's rolled out. So, Kiris, um, are you cited on the document Data Protection Impact Assessment um, that Police Scotland have produced? I was sent the document uh, a week ago, yes, because that's in, correct. In, in relation to, uh, this is question 45, in relation to the, implica 
it says one word in relation to Article 6 that there are yeah. no implications. That, that's correct. So that's, that's, that's uh, what I was ab about to say, that, that there were further concerns uh, on our side in relation to the impact assessment. So there are no consideration of Article 6, there are no consideration of Article 10, uh, freedom of information and, and, and speech. Seven and, and, nine and as well. the, Sorry, Article Seven and Nine. Apparently, there are no implications. That's correct, and um, and Article Eight it relies heavily on GDPR. Um, so there are significant concerns when it comes to the impact assessment, but um, we are willing to to work with with the police to to try to uh, uh, help um, as much as we can and to solve some of these questions. Okay, thank you, Fulton. I, mean, I, do, I do kind of think the, the point's been covered. Not unusual, if sure, Stevens. Stephen seems a step ahead of me, but I, but I will put it a slightly different angle if it does run the risk a wee bit for a repetition of answers. And I think we're all quite concerned about the possibility of uh, the collateral damage, uh, uh, as it's been called, of um, possibly private conversations uh, between people not involved in any investigation being brought in. But to put another sort of angle on it, a bit like Stuart Stevenson had done, if a device was being checked and came through a, a private conversation or, or whatever, and there was another situation came to light, perhaps uh, something that the public would expect the police to act on, such as a possible attack or something of that nature. Given how it's been, <coughs> how it had been identified, well, what what would be done in that situation? But, and, and I mean more like rather than the last answers that come in, more practically, what so just for the general person in the street, how 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 would you proceed with that? <coughs> well, it, the, again not knowing the specifics of the example we're talking about. But if there was a, a general threat to someone's safety or public safety, then I think there's a responsibility in the police to act upon that. Um, <clears throat> that may be an overriding principle. Uh, whether or not that would undermine a, a prosecution at a later stage is perhaps a, a secondary issue, you know, in the overriding pieces about protecting the public around about that. So it would very much depend on, on the nature of it. Um, you know, the, the point, and, and fairly common, is that Police will often secure a warrant to search a premises where they believe drugs have been supplied, and often within those premises they'll find other materials. The most routine one is perhaps a firearm. So they have a warrant to be in those premises, they have a warrant to search, but they have no power to, to seize a firearm. But clearly there's an overriding principle running about public safety and potential other offences, serious offences that people have committed. So at that point, not ordinarily, we would seek another warrant to remove the firearm from those premises. So it's, it's not <coughs> infrequent that those types of circumstances come up, but what I would say in terms of digital forensics, it is, it is less frequent as a situation where there are, there are elements of self-incrimination. And the checks and balances that are important to put in place are on about proportionality and necessity, so that you're not taking a very wide view of all the data that's within someone's device, but you're looking more particularly about the data that may have a bearing on the matter under investigation. Okay. Thank you. Liam, are you? Um, I was going to ask about the. the uh, good afternoon. I was going to ask about the um, uh, external and the stakeholder um, groups, and in a sense how they interact. Um, uh, I think we've, we've heard uh, mention of both having met on a couple of occasions, <laughs> most recently uh, over the course of the last uh, week. Uh, it'd be helpful to understand the frequency with which those groups are expected to meet. And indeed, the interrelationship between them is—is is, is the commonality between them a, a police Scotland presence in, in both? Is there any other um, sort of mutual membership um, arrived at? And, and what is the interaction between those two groups? Hey, convener. Um, so, for self for the committee, I'll just quickly run through the stakeholders group. So, I suppose broadly put, they are the other—the the group that may have a more in, uh, relationship with the criminal justice system, if you will. So, that's made up of the police authority. Mm -hmm. Um, of HMICS, of SPA Forensic Services, Crown, Crown Office Procurator Fiscals, Police Scotland Information Management, Police Federation, Staff Associations. Um, and I chair that group um, at this moment in time. Um, the reference group um, is chaired by our uh, Business Relationship and Partners lead, so that's a Police Scotland senior civilian member of staff um, who has no connection with cybercrime. Um, and we have offered the chair of that particular group to the attendees, and they are considering that position where they would wish to chair that group. Um, the people that attend that are Mr Amar Anwar, Human Rights Solicitor, Open Rights Group, Privacy International, uh, there's invites to Human Rights Commission, Diego, um, Information Commissioner's Office, Victim Support, and um, the, the Director and Assistant Director from CYPER, 
uh, the Institute for Policing Research attend that group. So that, that very point, Mr MacArthur was put to the external reference group, what relationship would they seek to have? Um, they wanted to retain some independence um, from the other group, um, but did ask that they could have access to the SPA, the police authority member that sat in that other group, so that they could have some um, any issues that they wanted to escalate or, or um, to articulate, that they could report that to the, to the police authority. So Mr Robert Hayes, who attends that group, is, is happy to facilitate that. And from time to time, at the request of the external reference group, will also attend that group. You mentioned earlier, I think, in relation to Mr Kiros's, um concern around uh, aspects of, of Article 8, that this had been put to um, stakeholder group and that um, Crown, uh, Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service had given assurance around the, the, the way that um, that issue would be dealt with under, other, under current practice. I mean, that kind of suggests that the reference group will raise issues that the stakeholder um, group will then um, uh, back, back or, or, or satisfy itself or are not issues. What's the report back mechanism for the reference group, which presumably had raised these issues in, in good faith and, and, and would expect a substantive answer as to, to, to why this uh, this concern was, was, was unfounded. Yes. So, so the minutes are published and a number of actions are taken from those respective groups. And what we're trying to do is provide an overview to each of the groups about the respective meetings. So whether Crown makes substantive points around about disclosure obligations, um, whether the reference group makes substantive issues around about the legal basis for phones being examined, then we will try and take them back to, to, to get a, a respective view from each of the groups and some of the key stakeholders on them and feed that back into their groups. And tabling in the meetings, how, how frequently? Uh, apologies, so we're meeting almost on a monthly basis at this moment in time. Right. Mr. Di Carose, permitting. Right. Mr. Carose, I mean, what's your um, uh, understanding or, or, or experience of the way in which that interrelationship is, is functioning? Um, we, we haven't attended the, uh, right. the, the meetings yet, so we were sent an invitation um, and, and, and we consider the invitation and we will attend the next meeting. So um, at, at this moment I will be uh, unable to, to answer that specific question, uh, but um, our views will be expressed in, in, in a different ways in, in, in through the website of the, the Commission, but also through different reports to, to this Parliament and, and, and even international bodies. As, as, as you know, we engage heavily with the UN. Right. Okay. I, if I could turn to the, uh, back to some of the, the kind of practicalities. Obviously, we've heard about um, the, the, the purpose of the kiosk, the kind of triage, uh, the, 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 the process where there is evidence of, of value to a particular investigation. That will then be passed on to the, to the hub. It, is that in, in every instance, um, or would there be further uh, investigation undertaken um, at a, a more local level if, if evidence of value was, was found to be on the device, or is at that point um, it automatically uh, then passed on to the, the hub for further examination? So, so we're, we're writing up the guidance documents in terms of the principles of use, and we're saying there's probably only a few exceptions where devices wouldn't go through through a, a triage process. Mm -hmm. And they're more particularly around about child sexual exploitation or abuse, um, and perhaps some professional standards issues where it may not be appropriate for local officers in terms of the well-being of those officers to look at that type of imagery, <coughs> um, or perhaps on the prof professional standards piece to be involved in the investigation at that stage. But what we are saying is that all devices taken should go through that local triage process. Um, what would happen is that the, the device is already legally taken, we would hope, there will be a number of checks and balances in terms of supervisory checks around about that. Um, and it would already have been logged within police systems as a, a production exhibit or a, or a piece of evidence, if you will. <coughs> what the triage uh, process allows the officer at the front line to do is to apply some disclosure principles, and in, in particular a test of relevance. Is there anything within that device that has a material bearing on the matter under investigation? And if the answer to that question at that point is no to the investigating officer, as provided by the trained operator, then the device can be returned to the owner um, quite quickly thereafter. Mm -hmm. So it may be interesting for the committee. I've looked at some figures since I think the first gave evidence at the committee in early May. <coughs> until now, there's been almost 5,000 devices submitted to our cybercrime hubs for full examination and full um, forensic examination and download of those devices. Now, uh, the figures we work at the moment, we suspect that probably less than 10 per cent of them would have passed that test of relevance in terms of having anything that was materially 
um, of, of bearing or, or benefit to the matter under investigation. So the large swathe of those devices now sit within our cybercrime hubs that could have been probably returned to the owners at a much earlier stage. Mm -hmm. The second advantage around about it is that the officer who's taking the device, who is going to the triage operators, can quite quickly look at any material that may be relevant to the investigation and perhaps build that into an investigation or interview strategy that he or she's compiling at that moment in time. In the absence of triage devices, what would ordinarily happen is that we go to a cybercrime hub and it's likely to be a number of months before the investigating officer would get any response in terms of what may or may not be on that <coughs> device. So it provides a much better service at the front end to the investigating officers and I think it provides a much better service to the public. But more particularly for me, and echoing some of the contributions made here today, we are perhaps there is a risk about the amount of data that we are we are downloading and examining from devices, which are needless uh, and is all about a process. Um, and the overriding principle is that uh, these triage devices do not extract or store any data on them. But what it does provide is an opportunity to apply that test of relevance and see whether or not the device needs to go any further in the criminal justice process. Mm. Well, we've heard examples earlier about um, uh, <coughs> child pornography, for example, and, and, and then the, the duties or the, the expectations upon officers to, to follow up those leads. But there'll be, there'll be examples that are uh, considerably less serious, but, mm. but, but possibly fall foul of, 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 um, uh, of the law in some way. And I suspect there'd be a public anxiety that, um, in a sense, that the, the phone is being um, taken and, and scrutinised for for one purpose, but there is a, a risk of self-incrimination um, that, that would span a wide range of fairly minor misdemeanours, but but would still be uh, counted as, as offences. I mean, what what assurances about that collateral impact um, can you offer in terms of the proportionality of the the, the, the use being made? I've, I've talked through some of the processes in terms of the supervisory checks and the pr proportionality uh, and necessity. So that, that starts at the very at the initial the device having been seized and that, an electronic submission through the cybercrime processes that a device is processed. I suppose the thing is, at the moment, what you've got is a hub process. Yeah. And I understand yeah. that the issues around the delays and, and the time taken to, to, to carry out those investigations and return devices to individuals. but. But at the, at the flip side, um, you've got far more individuals, far more officers, possibly civilian staff, but certainly um, uh, potentially all officers um, now in a position where they would be interrogating those devices and be required to be trained um, in, in how to handle that and, who's, and the, the use of whose discretion may potentially vary and therefore you'll have, you'll have officers who are absolutely on the money in, in, in terms of the way they apply those protocols but there has to be a heightened risk of, of officers um, being uh, I, I suppose uh, less able to interpret those protocols in a way that, um, the, the, that the public would expect and where concerns would then arise just by, by dint of spreading out the, 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 uh, the, the numbers of, of, of individuals that would have to be trained and, and then uh, implement, implement and act within those protocols there has to be a heightened risk does there not? Well, I accept the points you make, but I think the key word that you used there was discretion. So discretion is at the disposal of officers at this moment in time. Um, and I suppose if we are thinning out the volumes that go to the cybercrime hubs and the, the amounts of examinations, thereby we, we are reducing that risk and potential for those numbers. And I know you're saying the numbers are at the front end, but there is discretion available to those officers at the front. So they're fairly minor matters. Um, and it's difficult to give an explicit position, but mm -hmm. um, you know, it would depend on the severity of the crime or the information they've come across. Um, but I don't know that it necessarily raises an additional risk. I think that risk is, is ever present, is here at this moment in time, and is dealt with by way of discretion. It's open to the police. I think the, ri the risk, I think, comes from the, the, the fact that, as you've ex accepted, that the exposure to a vast amount of, of, mm -hmm. of data means that there is, that there is more potential for, for information to, to sort of come to light that would then require a, a, an exercising of that discretion that doesn't happen to the same yeah. extent now. I mean, I appreciate that all officers will have a level of discretion and, and we wouldn't want it otherwise. You need to trust them to, to act with a degree of common sense and, and, and proportionality. But actually that exposure to a vast amount of, of, of data, I would have thought, leaves open a, a wider risk that that discretion is, is exercised in, in a less proportionate Fashion. One final point, if I'm making, but I'm conscious of your time, I will try and get this very, very short. Sorry, so currently the process that we go to a cybercrime hub, there would be a full examination, so now all the data we push back to the investigating officer to make that determination. 
So I think that affords them a greater opportunity to look at self-incrimination across all the data. The process that we're looking to introduce is that the investigating officer would ask a very closed search parameters of the trained officer to, to examine the device and come back with, in effect, a positive or a negative response. So that, that amount of data is, is closed off in many respects to the investigating officer, and thereby I think the, the risk is reduced. Mr Kiros, are you wanting to...? That's a very important point in, in, in terms of um, training. Um, so there are 18, as far as, as we know, 18 police officers trained, and we don't know what is the type of training. And most privacy protocols fail because it's not a technical question, it, it's, it's a human question, as you said. So it's the, it's the people who are exposed to that. So who are exposed to that information are individuals, it's, 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 not, it's not the machine. So I, I think training is a, is a very fundamental question. And then the other point is that obviously there are good reasons to interfere with the right to, to privacy and Article A2 mm -hmm. uh, foresees those and prevention of crime and, and national security, etc. But what we think is that uh, without independent oversight, clear guidance, and examination of the, the pressing no, uh, social need to introduce this measure and, and the proportionality of the measure, there is a, a, a higher risk of being arbitrary or, or being uh, subject to abuse. And we think is some of those questions still are, are an, an answer. That um, a lot of the internal governance um, around the use of these devices is absolutely crucial. Crucial that there's proper guidance on what to do. Crucial that there's proper training, um, and crucial that there's over in internal oversight as well as external oversight of this as well by way of audit, step sampling, and, and ensuring officers know what they're doing, and that training isn't a one-off at the start, but actually if, if training needs uh, arise uh, through audit or whatever, that those are addressed um, at a, an appropriate stage as well. Um, I just want to engage with some of the numbers. Uh, first question, how long does the triage take? Um, it will probably depend, depend on the type of device Broadly. and the complexity of the device. I'll probably go to my technical expert, Peter, maybe <laughs> to answer that for me. Uh, all devices are different, and the, the, the triage system, much like the, the software that's used in the lab, will prompt you to do certain things. Uh, if it's a, I think what we would all understand is a burner phone, which is a phone that's not a mm. smartphone, uh, doesn't contain very much, mm. may only have the stuff on the SIM, that's going to be very mm. quick. Uh, well, what does very quick mean? Well, very, very quick could be uh, less than an hour. Right, OK. And a more complex one? If we go to perhaps an iPhone, uh, depending on the size of the iPhone, I think we'll do yesterday the they're going to be releasing something that's absolutely enormous in terms of storage capacity. That can take up to two to three hours, depending on how much data is on it. Uh, it's still got to go through the the, the, the system. Uh, on the on the triage system, you're going to uh, set parameters, and that's going to that's going to uh, narrow down the field of what you're going to look at, and that's where your your close questioning of Right. Well, that, 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 that's useful. Now, it leads me to my real question, which is, um, why is, tria is triaging done in the hubs currently? Because if 90% of what you're getting in is ultimately found to be of no uh, interest, are you triaging to try and find that 90% earlier on? No. We don't triage in the hubs. Uh, why? It's, uh, we, we, well, you, you know the level of submissions that we have. Uh, for me to run several phones through and produce something else for someone to review, that lets me put more phones, put more phones through and get more phones processed. So there's maybe an element of sausage factory in this. Uh, well, and if, 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 if I may, if the maximum is three hours, <coughs> that means of the 41 devices, uh, they will each be in use for mm. doing triage for 30 hours per month. That's what the numbers tell me. Um, and. It's, it strikes me that, that, in a sense, you're trying to get the things that are not worth dealing with out of the way first, and that's good news. Is there an implication that the 5,000 that are currently going to the hubs 
is constrained by the present arrangements and that you would expect it might that more than 5,000 would go through the triage system, but at the same time the number that go to the hubs would reduce. Is that where we're actually heading to? Absolutely. I, I think the, the pressures that are on, on the hubs uh, are matters of volume. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also have to satisfy the needs of procurator fiscals, who will give deadlines for, for things that they want, uh, and that has to be one of the, the first things that we do. So, so, if so, 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 just um, we really are running out of time, and I want to be trying. So, right. so really, we're we're trying to do two things with these uh, devices. First of all, return the phones to those people where the phone is of no interest much quicker, and get that out of the way. Absolutely. But secondly to get to the hubs a greater number of serious cases that can be properly, fully analysed so that we improve law enforcement where a mobile phone is part of the equation. If I may convene, so the, the 5,000 figure I gave you is what we'd have expected for this year. I think I've pre previously given evidence to the committee saying we are on track for about 15,000 devices a year, so that's based on the numbers of the last couple of years. So right. I think the 5,000 is an indicative figure in a four-month period. Um, and, and right. the 15,000 we'd expect to see in, in the course of a year. But the principles I articulate remain the same. Yeah, I think as right. soon as we get to the cybercrime hub, we're into full examination, yeah. joint reports, and at the criminal justice system. Convener. Can I ask the status of the individual <coughs> whose phone's being triaged for an hour? What is their status when this is taking place? It would, it would depend on the circumstances of, of the police contact with that individual. It may well be they're an accused person and they've been arrested. And it may well be they've been a witness to, to an incident and they've provided their phone and the police have taken it under a common law power. It would very much depend on the circumstances, Convener. Is, is, is that following the new change to right? Yes. Is that the only two statuses someone could have there? So they could be um, not officially accused or they could be officially accused. So or a witness. Or, a witness. or are we including not officially accused as being a witness? No, I'm not being pedantic with words, but it's clearly... Well, because the concern clearly, uh, and just to articulate the concern, is that there's the potential for some huge fishing exercise. Now, I know you'll say that you would neither have the time nor energy for that, but that is the concern, yes. that someone becomes involved in something, they're perhaps the subject of finding themselves in a police station, and there's an opportunity to look at their phone. So uh, their status at that moment, never mind the status of the inanimate object, I think is very important. So I've described the, the legal basis <coughs> on which the police could take the device, and I don't think there's any change to that. What the criminal justice legislation has, has provided is, is, is two distinctions between someone having, having had their liberty taken away from them and having been arrested. So they, they, are, they have been deprived of their liberty at that stage, whether they're officially accused or otherwise. But the, the reason that the term witness is important, because we had that earlier discussion about the remarks that are in some of your papers there about <coughs> the... Uh, Crown determining it's an operational police matter where a witness to withdraw their wish to have their phone examined. Yeah. So m my view would be a witness is something very different from someone who has been arrested. Indeed. Indeed. Daniel, you had questions for training? Yeah, I mean, I'd just like to follow on from Lee McCarthy's points about training. I mean, both, both Mr Kiras and, and, and Mr Friedland said training is very important. What I didn't hear was whether or not you based on what you've seen, whether you think that the training um, will be sufficient based on what you've seen from Police Scotland so far. Have you had any sight? <coughs> or, or? No, uh, the, uh, no, the quick answer is no. Um, unfortunately, no. And, 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 and again, uh, Mr Finley or already explained the, the importance of continuous um, training. Not only that there is a training, but uh, the scope of the training, human rights is a key element, and then that is continuous. So, so, so I'd, I'd just really like to go back to, to Ms McLean. I mean, I think, based on what we've, we've, we've heard this afternoon, that, that we're, 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 it's September now, and, and based on what you're saying, you are seeking to roll these uh, kiosks out in November, I, I understand. But strikes me from what we've heard, we're, we're st there, there still needs to be resolution around the legal framework, principles, and particularly human rights. That hasn't been done or hasn't concluded yet. And therefore, you need that to be concluded, surely, in order to devise the training which needs to take place before that. And so we've, we've really got a matter of seven or eight weeks to both conclude those legal and human rights principles, devise the training, and deploy the training 
is that enough time to do all of that? I accept, Mr Johnson, we've been extremely ambitious. So the training has been devised, it's been written up. Um, you're right, we are, we are very ambitious in terms of the time frames. Um, but I go back to that point earlier on. We understand that the rollout can only be once I've concluded all those other matters. So, so, sorry, how on earth can you devise training prior to really concluding the work on the human rights basis upon which you'll be carrying, carrying out this work? I, 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 mean, I, I really struggle with that in a quite fundamental way. Apologies, I should perhaps be a bit more explicit there. So what I mean by that is the actual training in terms of the operation of the devices. Right. Um, but hopefully we're building upon a knowledge base. I mean, police officers have not come to this um, blindly. It's built on a knowledge base where we understand proportionality, necessity, our legal powers, our responsibilities around about the, the articles. So we're hopefully building upon that. But you're absolutely right, the document sets that will support the delivery there need to be concluded, and we've set some quite ambitious timescales around about that. At, at what point does that ambition become um, over-ambition, if I can put it like that? We will we'll remain optimistic, but, but we understand there's a lot of work to be done. Okay. Thank you. Fulton. Yep, uh, thanks, um, convener. Police Scotland have stated before that download, downloading data from devices onto disks may be an option. Is that still being considered? Um, and, what, and has there been a solution for encrypting disks been found? Um, so <coughs> the, the technology that, that we've, we've bought, we've procured, has the ability to export data. But we've taken a conscious decision, and that's been welcomed by the groups, not to export any data onto disk. Okay. So the position that we will have is the devices will not extract data, will not store data, and will not export data onto any disk or any other format. OK, and what, what was the reasons behind that decision? Well, it's primarily around about data security, data privacy. So as soon as you export that, there's a whole range of um, audit and compliance you need to consider around about that. As part of the ongoing review, we will see if there's an evidence base for that. But in the absence of that, we, we're, it's not something we're, we're going to put in place at this time. OK. That's fine. OK, thank you. No one else? OK, um, can, can I just say, uh, Chief uh, Superintendent McLean, the, the, the committee's obviously very keen to understand police operations and, and put as much ensure that there's as much support to tackle crime. I wonder, would you reflect, and it's to go back to a comment I made right at the beginning, that this is completely back to front. There's been significant public expenditure, curiously just short of the amount which would trigger involvement for the police authority. Um, work was undertaken with no assessments. That, it, we, we would want an assurance that that won't be the way that you go about business henceforth and that you will engage meaningfully with Mr Freeland and Mr Quiros and indeed others on the wide-ranging concerns that remain about this, notwithstanding the work that's been done. And, you know, we do welcome the engagement. But do you understand the, the, the depth of concern there is? Excuse me. <coughs> Absolutely convenient, and I'll give you that assurance, which is why I've personally become involved in a number of the groups. Um, and hopefully Mr Freeland and Mr Quiros will will uh, participate within that and we'll see that openness and transparency we're trying to bring to what is quite a complex issue. I think it's wider than just cyber chaos. I think it's a wider piece of digital forensics for law enforcement. Um, and yes, there are absolutely lessons that will learn and I can give that assurance that we will be more considered in the future about how we approach these uh, challenges. OK, and, and we hear about the, the additional technology that's en route and the additional capacity there. Just to follow up <coughs> from my colleague, <coughs> Margaret Mitchell's comment there. We also get a, a, to reaffirm that if you fail to get the uh, approval of your colleagues either side there as regards the serious uh, human rights and legal aspects, that this won't proceed. Yeah, I, mean, I think I'm on record as saying that if there's no legal basis for us to continue uh, with this technology, then it will not proceed. OK. Thank you very much indeed. Can I thank you all for your, your written evidence for attending today? That's much appreciated. And we now move into private session. Thank you. Thank you.